downloads our messages, how afraid we are of just keeping on words, ideas, information, cramming the mind. thereby blocking the channel to the spirit. But we, we can do nothing but both appeal to thee and trust thee, the spirit of truth will himself pierce through the mind, the brain, the head, right down into those innermost recesses and make the word of God what it is said to be sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. Lord, let this be the effect of the ministry already today and now and onward. We look to Thee in our need, in our helplessness, apart from Thee, do Thine own work. For thine own name's sake. Amen. You will remember that yesterday morning, in our consideration, we stopped short and broke off before we were finished. But was on our heart when we were considering this other of the unsearchable riches of Christ, riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. And so we simply proceed with that this morning and not follow on to a fresh aspect. But I want to say here at the outset that this is going to be probably the most difficult thing to grasp, to understand, perhaps to accept of all the is being said this week. Peter, referring to all the letters of the Apostle Paul, did say our beloved brother Paul, but in the next breath he said, in all of whose letters there are some things hard to be understood. Now, uh, whether Peter meant that for himself, he hadn't grasped it all, or whether he was speaking about other believers, I don't know. But I'm not Paul. I'm not asking you to read my letter. But I do feel that about what is on my heart this morning, it will be difficult to understand. And you will be required to give very close and careful attention. Almost to every sentence. Because every sentence has a so much wider context than we can mention and refer to. 
Well, having said that, and I trust prepared you for some hard work, and I'm sorry that it comes at this time. I was waiting and watching for the opportunity to just get to my brother this morning, go right on over the second session. I could have come on this afternoon, all right, but I didn't get the chance. He didn't give me. He will suffer that you. So we will come to this, the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. And again, we are going to let Solomon help us as our interpreter or our pointer. The corollary of inheritance is, of course, heirship. And that of heirship is sonship. In the Bible, heirship means sonship with a particular connotation. At that point, we read, just to refresh our memories on this matter, from the first book of the Chronicles, chapter 28. 1 Chronicles 28, we just take out two verses from this larger setting. Verses 5 and 6. And of all my sons, this is David speaking, and of all my sons, the Lord hath given me many sons, he hath chosen Solomon, my son, to sit upon the throne of the kingdom of the Lord over Israel. And he said unto me, Solomon thy son, he shall build my house and my court, for I have chosen him to be my son. This is the Lord speaking. And I will be his father. Lord is leaping right ahead of David, isn't he? Of course, as we have said, with another in view. The greater son of David. The greater than Solomon. Jesus Christ. Who is here. So then, punishment. Is the focus of this hour. And you will notice that in these verses, as in others in this context, there was a selectiveness about this matter of sonship. The Lord has given me many sons, but He has chosen, he has selected, selected, Solomon, my son. We know that David had many sons. We don't know very much about most of them. One or two come right out conspicuously, like Absalom and Adonijah. But of all his sons, God selected Solomon, the son of David's old age. At the point of ripeness and maturity, sonship 
came into full view. The principle and reality of sonship emerged from a long history of maturing, of ripening, of bringing to spiritual fullness. And we are so much on one line this morning without any collaboration. This maturity in daily, out of which this sonship sprang forth, sprang into being, sprang to life, this maturity was through a long history of deep discipline. A long history of deep and often bitter experience of suffering. First there were the sufferings from without. Here where you must bring to mind more than I say, here's a brief statement. But oh, how much gathers around. No sooner was David anointed as a youth than trouble started in his life. Suffering. Oh, what a long, drawn out period of suffering and discipline under that man's soul. From the day that soul spied him, eyed him, with a jealous eye, and hurled his spear at him to transfix him, David evaded the fear play. Right on through those years of being hunted amongst the rocks and the hills and in the desert so that he cried like a pelican in the wilderness, like a sparrow upon the house top. And to Saul art thou come out to seek a flea? You know it all. Long bitter history of suffering coming upon him from without because of the anointing. Uh, here you've got to do some changing of your thinking. Oh, the anointing. Only we have the anointing. Oh, Lord will anoint us. Won't that be wonderful? Oh, that will be power. That... All right. On the day of the anointing, trouble began. Suffering began from without. Persecution of the usurping, envious, jealous forces. That's their nature. From without. And then that second period of suffering for it didn't stop when Saul was out of the way. I think perhaps David might have thought at one time, well, if only Saul is out of the way, <laughs> then life will go smooth. And that is why on more than one occasion, when Saul was at his mercy, David's would-be, would-be friend, that now you've got your job. God has delivered him into your hand. This will be your deliverance from all your trouble. Smite him. But David refrains, proves himself worthy of being a prince. But when Saul was written in battle, 
David's troubles didn't cease. But they changed. And now the period of suffering through his own fault. Formerly it was not the suffering through his own fault at all. Now through his own fault, you remember them. He spoke of Absalom. Absalom. The murderer brought back by David to Jerusalem without repentance, without contrition, in pride. And we know the story of how David suffered because of that weakness on his part. The weakness of sentimentality as over against divine principle. Oh, he suffered. I think that David never really did get over the effect of that episode with Absalom. I believe it registered something in his life forever after. Then that great mistake of numbering Israel, the uprising of conceit, pride, of arrogance, commanding there should be a numbering. One narrative says that Satan provoked him to do it. The other doesn't say that. He did it. And even this carnally minded, unspiritual man, Joab, saw through it. The Lord make the people ten thousand times more. But should my Lord the King do this thing? Nevertheless, David brushed aside Joab's judgment and went ahead and numbered. Do you remember the consequence? The angel of the Lord with his thorn door, offering David alternatives, testament, play, so on. And the mowing down, the mowing down, thousands in this world. This is, this is reaction to his pride, reducing, isn't it? where he wanted to multiply for his own glory. But what happened? This was through the exposure of himself. Suffering coming out of his own mistakes and faults. Again, when he would bring the ark to Jerusalem, sending to fetch the ark and bringing it on a new car carrying the testimony of the Lord on a bit of mechanical contrivance. A bit of organization which had its origin and inception amongst the Philistines. And as they came to the threshing floor, the oxen stumbled. The ark was in peril, and Asa put forth his hand to steady it, and the Lord smote Asa there that he died before the Lord. And so David was offended with the Lord, was angry with the Lord, turned the ark aside into the home of the house of Obed Edom, where it stayed for a long time, for years, and it says, and the time was long. And we can only imagine something of what David must have been going through. So that mistake, that mistake, policy in the place of principle. You got that? This world is run on policy in the place of principle. Policy. Policy. What is policy? What is diplomatic? Not principle. And how much of that there is 
even in Christianity. But here it is written large and glaring for our warning. God heaven does not hide the failures of his best servants. But they said that David must have suffered intensely over this mistake. And then what about Bathsheba? We started with that. We need not go over that bad, dark story again. Oh, the suffering that breathes itself through those songs. My, my sin is ever before me. Purge me with this. I shall be free. Happening through his own mistakes. Uh, let me say this at once. If you are ever looking for a man, be he a man of God, of the highest status, standing, who is faultless, you're going to be disappointed. And the Lord is going to allow you to be terribly disappointed because there's only one. No one is going to take his place. This one. But again, there is this about sovereign grace. You know, if we were not believers, if we were not the Lord, if we were not under the hand of the Lord, these things, that, these mistakes that we make, these blunders that we make, these wrong things in our lives, would be our entire undoing. We should be sorrowing as those who have no hope. But while it is true that in the life of believers, very often there are these shocking mistakes, God sovereignly has hold of them for training. That's what we come into. Suffering was to come because of our own foolishness and weakness. And then, I think it must be, have been a poignant night. When after pouring and stopping all the material for the house of the Lord, to realize his lifelong ambition to find a place for the Lord, Nathan was sent by the Lord to him, Thou shalt not kill me. That must have been a stunning blow. And I think through the hours of that night, David must have had a very, very deep, dark time. All his life ambition and all his preparation for its realization cut down. One blow, thou shalt not kill me in time. But by some. Opposite. But here are the sufferings through which this man went, which brought him to maturity. The spiritual maturity. Which made him the man to whom the Lord can refer again and again and yet again with pleasure, with delight. The New Testament has nothing in it about the dark side of David's life, and yet it mentions him over 30 times. How wonderful the Lord is, how gracious. All his sufferings of every kind were used by the Lord to bring this man to the place where the Lord could look upon him. A man after my own. Man after me. That's unbearable grace. Now, out of all that suffering emerged Sunday. Emerged Sunday. It wasn't killed. That day, when that 
calling was completed. And David had rest that the Lord spoke about his son and brought Solomon into view as the selected one. I do want you to keep your finger on that word selected and hold it as we go on. Watch. As we turn now from Solomon, from David, over to David's greater son, to the New Testament, to the New Testament. We have said that here, sonship has a peculiar connotation. Sonship in the New Testament is not just birth into the family of a male child. Sonship in the New Testament is something more than birth into the family. And it is something different. Watch this closely because I feel this to be one of the most vital issues, perhaps, of this conflict. Yes, sonship in the New Testament is more than birth into the Lord's family. Of course, birth, childhood, is potential sonship. We are sons of God through faith potential. Potential. But not absolutely. Not absolutely. There is a special word in the New Testament related to sonship. Not to childhood, but to sonship. That word is adoption. Adoption. You're familiar, familiar with it, aren't you? You can look it up. I can't give you all the references now and put all the scriptures. But there it is. Adoption. And adoption in the New Testament is something different from birth, from being a child in the family. I was talking to a Hebrew scholar last week and I raised this question with him. I said, as far as I can discover, this idea of Paul's about adoption has no place whatever in the Hebrew economy. I can't find it at all in the Mosaic economy, in the Old Testament. He said, you're right. And I said, I go further, because this Hebrew scholar was also a Greek scholar. I go further, I cannot find it in the Greek world, this idea that Paul has about adoption. I can only find it in the Roman world, as a part of the Roman system and economy. He said, you're right. And then I got this and wrote it down. illustrating Paul's acquaintance with Roman law. With Roman law. The process of legal adoption by which the chosen heir became entitled not only to the reversion of the property, but to the civil status to the burdens as well as the right of the adopter became, as it were, the other self of the adopter. The heir, by adoption, became the other self of the one who adopted him. One with him.
This was a principle and a practice in Roman law. It was the placing of one who was already a child in the family in the position of responsibility to represent and act for the father who adopted his own child for that purpose. There was a ceremony of adoption of his own child. The boy who had been with him through the years in the family, his own child, came to the day of adoption when he was placed, placed, and given the father's honor, the father's responsibility, the father's trust, that wherever that son, not that child, that son went, it was in effect the going of his father. Now, Paul has lifted that right up, you see, the, the Roman economy, and brought it into Christian teaching, truth, and he uses it again and again. And dear friends, I would want, I would ask you to note, with that word adoption, it is usually in the future. Romans 8, waiting for the adoption, the which for redemption of the body. The manifest of the Son of God, future. This thing, adoption, is future. It's something more than being a child of God. Adoption is child placement. And that is Hebrews 12, if you like to read it carefully. And scourges every son whom he places. Whom he places, that's the other. Not whom he receives, whom he places. Adoption is child placing or placing in the meaning of sonship. Now is that difficult to understand? Let me say then, that sonship in the New Testament is the highest and greatest thing that ever God has revealed to man. The greatest thing that ever God has revealed to man is this destiny to which he has called his sons. You know that the letter to the Hebrews is wholly based upon this. It begins with God has spoken unwise at the end of all his speaking. He has now spoken unwise. The original does not say in his son, although of course it means this. But it says just as unwise. Unwise. And then that whole letter goes on on that basis. I'll come to that again in a minute. Sonship means the full concept of God in creating man. Representation of God. Let us make man in our own image and after our own likeness. What is that if it is not representation of God? But when you will see the man perfect, then you will see God in expression. That's what we've been hearing this morning. Whether it be the city or the bride or the body, whatever it is, when the work is finished, it will be 
that man is an expression of God. Representation, that's the destiny for which God called and created man. Responsibility. I know, I think, what our brother would have gone on to say this morning if he'd had more time. I think he would have come to the, the real meaning of the city, not only its nature. What is a city? Well, what is Washington? What is London? It is the administrative center of the whole realm. The governmental focal point. The city, the new Jerusalem, is only a type and figure after all, a symbol of the church, glorified, but in its predestined position to govern the nations that walk in the light thereof. But this is something special, something specific, something different. A governmental position, a responsibility through the ages to come. When the Lord put his hand on Solomon, Solomon thy son, the Lord hath chosen Solomon of all my sons. It was with the throne immediately in view. The throne immediately in view. The governmental position and responsibility was there at once. Notice that, don't you? And here we are, Sonship emerges in this great trust for God throughout the ages to come in government. We have often said it, and I believe it is quite true, that just now the world rulers of this darkness are the evil powers in the heavens. Well, I don't think there's any doubt about that. The evil power, the Satan at their head, in the unseen, in the heavens, principalities and the powers and the world rulers of this darkness, Host of wicked spirits in the heavens. They are governing this world. They are influencing this world. They're having a great deal to do with the thought of this world. It does not set the Lord aside as supreme Lord. He is, he is using all that. He's making it subject to his end, but there they are. He's not annihilated this other room there. And I confess to you that one of the most difficult problems that I have in the New Testament, I've wrestled with this problem a good deal. I don't know that I've finally got the answer yet. It's Paul's Christ saying, but Satan hindered. This Paul who speaks about Christ set far above all rule and authority and principality and power in this age and in that which is to come. And here is a servant of God seeking to pursue the course of his divine vocation to fulfill the eternal purpose of God. And he says, And I, Paul, once and again would have come to you, but take it. Now you can get down to that one and give me the answer if you can. But there is a statement. That Satan is very active. He does have powers of frustration. Interfere. He's always interfering. Well, that's another line by itself, but it's a statement of fact. These evil forces are the forces which are so much influencing men and things on this earth. They are going to be displaced for the government of the new creation, the new heavens and the new earth, they will be wiped out, put into the abyss. But God never believes in vacuum. 
and their place is going to be taken by the church. Know ye not the saints? The saints shall rule the world. You shall reign with me. Go on. That again in a moment. This, this, dear friends, is what is inherent in sonship. It's the throne, the rulership, the great trust and honor God conferred upon the Son, the Son. And this, to take out what our brother's been saying, is the explanation of the child's training. The child's training. Hebrews 12, as you know, my son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord. Whom the Lord loveth, he chastens. God dealeth with you as with sons. We have had fathers after our flesh who chastened us. as it seemed good to them, as it pleased them. I don't know. It's always a pleasant thing for a father to chasten his child. However, uh, by the way, we've had fathers of our flesh who chastened us. Shall we not be more in subjection to the father of what? Our spirit? Oh, that has a big context, hasn't it? The father of our spirit. That which was born again. Not our bodies, certainly. And not our souls. Our spirit. The father of our spirit. And this power training, this discipline, It goes right to the depth of our inner being. It, it's a spiritual thing. It focuses upon our spirit. We have spiritual suffering. That's where it is really. You see, you may have a lot of trouble. All sorts of things. You may have rheumatism. You know, you may have this or that infirmity in the body. And, and you may just... Write it off as that. Oh, my rheumatism is bad today. Uh, or whatever it might be. Your, your outward form of suffering. If you do that, your only recourse is to the doctor. To the doctor. As he can help you. But if you realize that this is a spiritual power. It's touching me deeper. Touching my relationship with the Lord. It's touching my walk with the Lord. It is just touching me in the realm of my spiritual life. Are you got the key, God's key, then, to the discipline? Then it is not just your physical or bodily infirmity. It is your spiritual training. And it's wonderful, isn't it, what the Lord can do. I've often told of an incident of many years ago. I was speaking at a Keswick convention in the south of England. And after the meeting, a brother came to me. I hadn't met him before. I discovered that he was a doctor. He said, Mr. Sparks, I, my wife is an invalid. She's been confined to bed for 20 years. Uh, I wish you would come along, pay her a visit, have prayer with her. But I think it would be a help to her. So uh, I said, I come this afternoon, and I went home and prayed about this. Oh, Lord, make me a blessing to this dear woman. And so on and so on. I put myself in that position of someone going, you see, to help somebody in trouble and doing good day. And I arrived at the house, and the doctor opened the door, said, come in, come upstairs. And I went up, he showed me into the bedroom, where I was expecting to find a poor, suffering, 
woman in distress, bowed down, and I saw in that bed something radiant. Something radiant. The very room was full of the peace of God. And I sat down. I didn't kneel down. And she began to talk to me. And if ever there was a flowing out a stream of light, of glory, do you think I could pray for that, that dear woman? Be a blessing to her? I, I went down with him in utter shame. I? Minister to that? I don't know anything about that. I don't know anything about that. I've never been that I, I remember it, you see, to this day. Yes. He could have lain there and moaned about her suffering, long drawn out, all that, instead of that. It was the glory of the Lord because she was taking it in the right way as her spiritual training. I expect to find people like that in a very high place in, in the city, in the kingdom, carrying responsibility. My last touch with Miss Amy Carmichael, Donovan, how many of you? Know that name? You know her book, Delivery? The wonderful work God used her to do in India. My last touch with her was when she was not far from the end. She had been lying for several years in complete helplessness, much suffering. And I was shown into the room and I went and said, Stay quiet. Thought that perhaps I, I, well, what was I going to say to this person that would be helpful to her? The time when I was being very much persecuted and ostracized, and she had heard all about it. She had heard all about it, all the re bad reports about this man coming in and I said, What am I going to meet here? And she smiled beautifully. Do sit down. She said, I'm so glad to meet you because you are a fellow lover of my Lord and that's all that matters. And the fragrance of Eden was in that room. Beauty of holiness. Peace. Joy. And she went quietly away to be with the Lord like that. Register. Oh, you see, there are sufferings and suffering. The Lord's intention in our sufferings is our spiritual maturity and rightness with a purpose. And this purpose is reign with him if you suffer with him. You shall reign. It's the throne that is in you, not just to get into heaven, not just to get into heaven, but to have an abundant entrance into the everlasting. That means being brought into a great responsibility because we are qualified to take it through the work of God in us. Now, in a few remaining moments, let me bring you right up against the sea because you may be thinking this is some particular teaching. I've got into a lot of trouble with this. I suppose one might ought to expect it. But dear friends, this is not a teaching and this is not something I have read or concocted. This is something that has come to me along the line of a, a very big challenge. It's the challenge of the New Testament. 
because the Old Testament is implicit. But particularly the challenge of the New Testament. And when you are brought face to face with what I have said and I'm, am saying, you are really brought face to face with your New Testament. Take it on the broadest basis. I ask. Why is it that more than 90% of the New Testament was written for Christians? If you're a Christian, if you're born again, if you have accepted the Lord Jesus as a Savior, haven't you got everything? Haven't you arrived? One more is necessary. Why the New Testament then? Even the Gospels were written for the believers, remember? Hmm? Why all this? New Testament, with all its entreaty to believers, its admonition of believers, its exhortation to believers, and its warnings to believers. Why all this? Well, some have resulted, you see, on systematized doctrine. And that is the, the strength of Arminianism. Because, because your salvation is in danger. Because it's possible, having once been saved, to be eternally lost. Once having received the gift of eternal life, to have it taken away. Well, I'm not going to argue that. Believe it if you like. I don't believe that's the answer to the New Testament. Any more than the other extreme is the answer which our brother has spoken. The ultra-Calvinism, which is only another word, ultra-Calvinism, another word for fatalism. Fatalism. Well, what is to be will be? And it wipes the floor of all this. Well, why all this new testament? This appeal and its warning and it's urgent. If there is not something more than being saved. That's the question. If there is not a difference between a child and a son, or between being in the family and obtaining the inheritance. The inheritance. Well, that's the broad basis. What about Paul? Paul personally. I came up against this, you see. And you will, you must, you cannot put on bleachers over this man. You must look it straight in the face. And Paul, in his letter to the Philippines, brethren, oh, this man is at the end of his long life of devotion and service and suffering. No man more utter for the Lord than this man. Here he is in his prison in the last days of his life. And he's saying, Brethren, I count not myself yet to have a pain. Neither am I already complete. Complete. Full. But there's one thing I do, forgetting the things which are behind, I press toward the pride of the unhide calling. The prize of the unhide calling. Do you believe that Paul was afraid of losing his salvation at that time? Oh, it would involve the righteousness of God, wouldn't it? 
and a lot of other things too. Oh no, he has seen something. He has seen something beyond being saved, marvelously saved, wonderfully saved, and fully saved, but something more. That is why he was saved. Unto what? In God's mind. And here he's saying to the Corinthians, let having preached to others, having heralded others, I myself should be rejected. For oh, what? Surprise. Lest I should be rejected, cast away, when it comes to the prize. No, Paul's fear was not fear of losing his salvation. Can't believe it at all. You come to this letter to the Hebrews, and as I have said, it's built upon this very thing, sonship from beginning to end. And in the end, this sonship is set forth in the figure of a race. So great a cloud of witnesses in the gallery, the heavenly gallery, we down here in the race, let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking away unto off unto Jesus, the author, yes, and the perfecter of faith, over the joy that was set before him. Remember the original said, in Head of the joy set before him. And was that the Mount of Transfiguration? He could have gone right in, so far as his own rights were concerned, into the glory. Glory had come, and he could have gone up with the glory, so far as he himself is concerned. He came down the mount. And instead of the glory, then, he endured the cross, despised the shame. For us, that's the letter to the Hebrews. For us, Bring us in. The sonship. The sonship run with patience. Well, you know, this sonship can be sabotaged by many things. And if there's one thing the enemy will try to do, it will be come in between the Christian and their being saved and their attaining unto the full purpose of their salvation. So stop the way. Truly as the nations stood athwart the path of Israel when they were moving over into the land, in effect saying, you shall not inherit, you shall not see. So these forces in the heavens stand athwart our path, stop us coming to the inheritance. That is why the Christian life becomes a conflict, a battle. And Use our brother's language, cheer up, it's going to get worse. Yes, yes, it is getting more and more intense for believers to go right on. Stand fast and go on. Oh, yes, it is. You ask some of our brethren in the Far East about that. In Siberia, China and other places. Oh, it's becoming intense. To hold on our way. It's a battle. But you see, the prize is there. And I do not understand the first two chapters of the book of the Revelation unless what I have been saying is quite true. To him that overcometh is the word to lay this year will I grant to sit with me in my throne. Well, if I don't overcome, what is forfeit? My salvation? You see, this thing has been sabotaged by certain interpreters and commentators to say those people to whom the letters in Revelation were addressed were not Christians. They were only professing Christians. I don't believe it. I don't believe it. Read again. There's no logic in what is in those letters if they were not believers. 
to believe. Let no man take thy crown. Let no man take thy crown to believe us. It was him that overcometh. And the high point of overcoming is to sit with me in my throne, whatever that means. Now, this is a matter of vital consequence, dear friend. Really, perhaps what the Lord would bring to us as a challenge. It's what the letter to the Hebrews again says. Let us go on, not laying again the foundation. But let us go on. Let us go on. Everything, not for our being saved, but the purpose of our being saved is bound up with our going on. It's going to be costly. But I, I'm quite sure so sometimes even this kind of assurance and glorying becomes enshrouded in clouds. But I'm quite sure that when you and I, if we go through, right through, come to glory and are placed in the great day of adoption, are placed, place that God eternally intended us to be in that responsibility, great responsibility for governing the nations that will walk in the light thereof, governing the earth. We shall say then, it was worth it, brother. It was worth it. Often I was tempted to just drop down and be satisfied with being saved and getting into heaven. But I'm glad I never did compromise. It's worth it. The Lord help us to go on. <coughs> In all this, we need that touch of thy finger, O Lord, where we see, we understand, on how much we shall need thy grace to accept, to go on a lonely way, not understood by perhaps the majority even of Christians, ostracized by even leaders amongst thy people, a lonely way, a difficult way. Help us, Lord. Oh, help us not to cast away our confidence, which hath great recompense of reward, but to stand, withstand, and having done all, to stand. So help us, God, in the name of the Lord Jesus.